All right. Good morning, church family. It's a joy and a blessing to see you here this morning. Um, if you're wondering where a few folks are, we have about 130 of our church family that's out at Camp Change at Looters right now. We're doing a family edition of camp, and so um, they are going to be worshiping. They're worshiping right now as we're worshiping too, and so what a cool thing. If you would stand with us, and uh, we're going to sing this morning together. to love you You are good and you are kind You bring joy into my life You make it easy to trust you You have never left my side You've been faithful every time All I want Oh, all I want is you, Jesus. All I want is you. You are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you a million reasons to trust you nothing to fear for you I'm by my side I'll follow you anywhere oh Jesus you came to my rescue took my place upon that cross you redeemed My whole world revolving around you. You're the center of my life. You're the treasure. You're the prize. Oh, all I want is you, Jesus. the refuge. You are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you. I'm by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. Wherever you lead me, wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, oh, all I want is you, Jesus, all I want is you, wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, oh, all I want is you. Jesus, all I want is you. Wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, oh, all I want is you. Jesus, all I want is you. Yeah, you are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you. I'm by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. Follow you anywhere. And oh.
you guys have a seat. Good morning. Whew. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord because we are alive and breathing. And that is, that's all the reason that we need. Good morning. My name is Stephen. I'm the student pastor here. And I just got to tell you, uh, PJ and I came in late last night uh, from Camp Change Family Edition. And they're still going out there this morning. And it is, it is so cool to see God moving in the lives of our families, moving in the lives of, of these young people that were out there, um, worshiping together, playing together, reading God's word together. Um, it was just such a wonderful time. And so we want to thank you, uh, those of you who helped make that happen, and just continue this morning uh, to pray for God to move in the lives of our families and, and of our students. And uh, if you have Facebook, you probably can see some of the pictures there. I had, I had 200 notifications on my Facebook page um, because I'm one of the admins. And I think uh, some of you, where's Linda Pippen? Are you here, Linda? She's, she's out there. She went through and liked every photo. And so I got a notification for every photo. Anyway, man, it was such a wonderful time. Um, and so if we do this again next year, I would, I would highly encourage you to be a part of it with us. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we have going on today. If you would check your bulletins, I'm not going to hit everything this morning, but I do want to point out a couple things. This Wednesday, um, we're not having um, like laugh and we're not having our student ministry, but we are having a children's ministry informational meeting. Um, it's going to start at 6 p.m. It's going to be in the kids zone. And if you were at all interested in serving our children, man, this is such a wonderful thing to do, to be able to pour into the lives of these kids, to sow the seeds of the gospel, um, to just build those relationships with them. Please consider coming to this meeting Wednesday at 6 p.m. I do want to say this. If you're new here, welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. In the seat back in front of you, there is an informational packet about who we are as a church, what we believe. And then there's a little tear-out section there. Um, with a card, an informational card. If you wouldn't mind just filling that out and dropping it in one of the offering boxes um, at the edge of our sanctuary, we would love that. Big weekend is coming up soon for our student ministry. This is in your bulletin. Um, it's going to be happening September 10th through the 12th. Um, we were going to do it in the spring, and then we all got covid and then we rescheduled it, and then the ice storm came. And so we're like, okay, well, let's do it in the fall. So that's what we're doing. It's going to be here um, in about a month and a half. And so if you're at all interested in serving and helping out, please talk to me. And um, as always, you know, helping students go who may not normally be able to afford to it, or just serving in any way, we would love for you to be a part of this. Sign-ups go live next Sunday at 5 p.m. So that's when sign-ups are going to go live and then um, also for a student ministry, if you would like to play paintball, if you're a student or an adult, you're more than welcome to come and play paintball with us next Sunday right after Lifetime. Please let me know today. Also coming up, um, we are having a Lifetime Expo two weeks from today in the Fellowship Hall. So our Summer 6 is going to end next week. And then what we want to do is we want to give you information about all the different classes that are going on. So that's going to be happening in two weeks. The classes are going to have some stuff presented in the fellowship hall for you to see and for you and your family to pick a class that's going to be just right for you. Bible in 90 Days is coming up soon, August 12th and 13th. And this is such a wonderful ministry that we have here at our church. And so this morning... Um, if I can invite Kathy Cornell, she's going to come up and she's going to share uh, just a word with us um, about what this, this ministry meant to her. My duty asked my wife to give a short testimony about the Bible in 90 days and she asked me to pray for her. <laughs> so bow your heads, please. Lord God, we thank you for your written word, Lord. We thank you that we have the freedom that we have to just study it, Lord. And I pray now that you give Kathy the words that she wanted to have. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Everyone knows that I am not a speaker. I am not a speaker, but I do love the Lord. Amen. And I just want to tell you today, the Bible is God-breathed. Every word in the Bible is true and accurate. And the the biggest thing that we have to do is we have to set aside the life. 
just life outside, everyday life, and put God first. Make him the Alpha and the Omega in your life. Read every word, understand those words, and follow those words. And if you do that, God's going to bless that in your life. When you have storms, you, if you know how, how God wants you to move forward in that storm, then you're not going to know. There's so many people in the world right now that they do not know the Lord. So they, they just flounder, they wonder, they don't know, and they just wreck their lives. So we took Judy's class, 90 Days, the, the Bible in 90 Days. And it's pretty rough. I mean, it's a lot of reading, and you got to get it done. But it's important to discipline yourself every day to do it. You know, we, we let life get ahead of us and get, well, I've got to get this done, got to get that done, got to get this. But really, the most important thing to get done is to be in the, in the Lord's Word. Amen. Commit it to your heart so that when you're, you're in that storm, you bring it forward, you bring it up, and you, you call on the Lord and you trust in everything that he does in your life, but you have to know it. And so Judy's going to have another class, um, the Bible in 90 Days. She's going to have that August the 12th and 13th, is that right? And it, it is just a great class. We have such good camaraderie in there. We discuss topics. We talk about things, and we just bond, too. So I just would invite everybody to do that and take the time to do that. And most importantly, give your life to the Lord Amen. and trust that no matter what that storm is, no matter how difficult it is, God's in control Amen. of everything. Thank you. Amen. Good food, too. Thank you, Kathy. The final thing I want to uh, remind us of is the, the Open Door Scholarship Fund. Uh, again, we had a generous donor who was going to be matching uh, $12,500 towards that so we can help families and kids go to Open Door. We love Open Door, and we love what God is doing there. Enrollment is up. We're so excited about this next school year. And by you giving to that fund, you're, you're helping families go that may normally not be able to go. And so please uh, consider that. Um, this week. That is all that I have announcement-wise for you this morning, so I want to invite Jimmy and Kay Gwen up to uh, continue our service with scripture and prayer. Okay, well, my wife Kay is going to read some scripture for you this morning. Yes, uh, Pastor Joe asked us to read this blessing from the Lord today, number six, verses 24 through 27. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So then they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Amen. Um, Pastor Joe asked me to pray. I'm going to pray that I figure out how to spell egalitarianism. <laughs> and he will, he will be able to ex, he'll be able to explain that to us a little later on uh, in the sermon. No, seriously, pray with me. Father, we're, it's good to be able to worship together, whether it's remotely at Camp Change or, or here in the, the building or folks listening. And just to be able to sing your praise together, study your word together, fellowship together. Um, I do pray that you will give your peace and protection as scripture said in the blessing to those who are suffering, Lord, uh, physically and mentally and spiritually. And that, uh, Lord, this, this day might be the day of, of salvation for many in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you would take a moment to stand, I'm going to give you about 30 to 40 seconds to greet those around you, and then I'll call you back for worship.
you guys make your way back to your seats. Um, this morning our worship set is going to be what I like to call uh, a throwback set. And that's something that uh, the younger people say when they, they want to do something that happened um, a long time ago. And so for these songs, these songs are like coming home to me. Uh, most of these songs were written 15 to 20 years ago. And a couple of them uh, take some older hymns and um, bring them into a more contemporary fashion. And so my heart for you this morning is that as we sing these songs, maybe uh, you would think back to the time in your life um, when these songs were written or maybe when you first heard them. Um, and you would remember God's faithfulness then. And we would celebrate his faithfulness now. And we would look forward uh, to his continued faithfulness for every breath that we have. Let's sing this together. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him my own. A crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him my own sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Sin had left. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. See now this morning, oh praise the one. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up. 
you take a moment just between you and the Lord just to thank him to thank him for taking your place on that cross to thank him for for bearing the burden the punishment for all of us that we might have eternal life come before you with a heart of worship this morning. God, you did not have to to give your life for us. You did not have to bear the punishment for our sin and shame, but your word says because of the great love with which you loved us, because you are rich in mercy, and because of the joy set before you that you endured the cross that we might become your sons and your daughters. Father, that, that the way that you look at your son is now the way that you look at us through faith in him. And so God, I just pray this morning, would you give us a vision of you so clearly that you are the one true God. You are the one who loves us so much. God, I thank you, Lord, for every person here and every person that's listening. God, that you have led them to this moment right now. God, open our eyes that we may see you, that we may worship you for who you are. In Jesus' name. down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you so here I am to To say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so I. Here I am. 
together lovely. You're all together worthy. You're all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon. to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. You're all together worthy. You're all together wonderful to me. And here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am my God, you're all together lovely, you're all together worthy, you're all together wonderful to me. Let's just sing that one more time with just the voices. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. You're all together worthy. You're all together wonderful to me. we sing this next song, I want to open up the altar. If there's anything that you need to come and, and lay down before the Lord, if you just want to cry out to Him, um, whatever you need, this altar is open this morning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Save the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught. My heart to fear and grace my fears really how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believe my chains are gone. Been set free, my God, my Savior is ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. You. Yeah. 
Father, we, we can sing about it and we can talk about it and we can contemplate it. But Lord, there's no way we can understand your amazing grace. What would, what would give you the desire to reach down into the pit, the miry clay, and lift us out? And not just lift us out, but, but call us to be your dearly loved children Lord to make us heaven ready God for you to say I want to spend an eternity with you holy perfect God loving us absolutely loving us fully and loving us eternally so thank you God for this amazing grace and and even if we don't understand it, Lord, help us to, to walk in it and live in it and extend it to others. We bless you, Lord. We pray for those who are, who are at family camp right now, God. Just finishing up, God, pour yourself out upon them. Chris, as he preaches, and, and God, as they worship and as they hear your word, God, just do a great, great work in our families and the, and the campers that are there. And Lord, may we, this morning, not put you in a box of our own making. May we let you be God and, Lord, you do as you please. And our desire this morning, Lord, is to please you and to follow you in obedience and faith. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Great to be with you. I be tell you, I'm, I'm a little spoiled at being at camp. I mean, we were rocking the house. There was, some, there was some worship going on and some witnessing and preaching. I mean, it was just, it's just been a great experience. I guess what I would have to say is uh, uh, you just, just had to be there, okay? That's all I know to tell you. And so next year, you just have to be there. 
come to camp and, and have a great uh, experience. And I'm not, I, I don't know, you know, we were just kind of like, let's try this. Let's see if it works. And our staff just really stepped out in faith. And uh, it, it, was, it, it exceeded my expectations, and they were pretty high. So enough, oh, yeah, let me say, well, you know, every time I go to camp, I try to learn at least one thing, and I learn one thing. Don't play, don't play paintball with Kinsey Birdwell. <laughs> she, is a, she is a cross between the Terminator and Rambo and Chuck Norris. She is fearless, and I'm telling you, uh, I didn't even play. I just, this is the stories I heard from the, from the paintballers. But uh, anyway, and also one more thing, Shawnee, Shawnee Stoker, our missionary in Jordan. Would you stand up? Let's welcome Shawnee back. We pray for, and, and we want to, you know, we want to just support her with love and prayers in any way we can. Okay, I want you to open your Bibles this morning to Romans or Genesis, or Galatians, or 1 Timothy, or 1 Corinthians, or just kind of anywhere you want to, because we're probably going to hit that. We're, gonna, we're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture, and uh, I'll be giving them to you. And I think, honestly, this would be a really good morning to write down, write down some scriptural references so that you can go back and study them and, and look at them in a little more detail. Obviously, we only have uh, so, uh, so long to do that this morning. But we're going to take what I consider one of the three hottest topics in Christianity today. And as we've started this series on hot topics, I've heard from many of you, and you said, well, we're so proud to have such a brave pastor. And I, I mean, really, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I do. But I want to tell you, want to really know the truth of the truth? The truth is a mature congregation is the key to this. People who don't, don't fly off the handle and people that just, you know, don't, don't just dig in or don't start, but who have the maturity and the, the security to listen to these hot topics and be challenged by these. And uh, we're going to kind of put you to the test today. I pastored in Gentry, Arkansas for almost, well, about 11 and a half years, and there was a girls basketball coach there named uh, Scotty Nolan and Scotty was the first coach to lead a, grand, uh, a gentry athletic team to a state championship and he was kind of a legend in our community well after his 10th season he resigned and I saw him one day and I said Scotty I mean why why are you leaving gentry and he said well every year you lose 10 percent of your supporters and it's been 10 years, so I'm out of support. I've got to go somewhere else. The messages that I'm sharing with you have the potential to lose at least 10% of the, of the congregation, except for the one today. It's got the poten potential to lose about 90% of you all. I mean, this, this is a hot topic. And, and, you know, when I'm really thoughtful Patty will look at me and she'll go, what are you so angry about? What are you so upset about? I go, well, I'm really not. I just, I'm just really thinking about this. So today, if I see a bunch of angry looks, if I see everybody all twisted up, I say, they're just being thoughtful. Your thought-provoking message. So uh, all that to say, you, can you see I'm kind of trying to set you up and get you ready for a message? One of the things I did when I lived in Arkansas is I... I liked football, and so I began officiating. I got with an officiating crew, and we traveled over. I, I wasn't the referee. Uh, we're in the white hat. I was, I was the sideline judge or the uh, field judge, and I had to listen to the coaches, you know, the, the whole time. But here's one thing I learned. I learned that, that people see what they want to see. And if I made a call against the opposing team or, if I, or, or a penalty or something like that, everybody on our team, yay, boy, I mean, I was the greatest, I was eagle eye, I saw everything, man, what an awesome official I was, but if I made a call against the team, or ruled a fumble, or anything like that against our team, all of a sudden, I was blind and stupid, and you see, we have that tendency in every area of life, even reading the Bible, listening to sermons, 
It, it, comes through, it comes through my perspective. It comes through what I think I know about a subject. It comes through what I think is right. And I'm, I'm just trying to say here that, that, that don't, don't be so dug in in what you believe that you're unwilling to let God do more in your life and teach us more. If anyone here thinks they have the whole truth and nothing but the truth and they've got it all, that's, that's more arrogance than it is maturity. And so we're going to dive into a, to a very hot topic. As, as Jimmy said, egalitarianism versus complementarianism. Now, I have a rule in life, don't use words you can't spell. But on the other hand, sometimes I like to show off that third grade education of mine. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to use, these are the words that are being used. And if you hear them, I want you to understand what they mean and the implications of those, of those two words. So let's just start off by defining these words. Egalitarianism means that, that is the doctrine that all people deserve equal rights and equal opportunities. Now, I think most of us here would probably say equal rights. That's, that is important. I mean, everybody ought to be able to drink out of the same water fountain. Everybody ought to have the right to have a public education up to a certain level. We might disagree where that level is. Every person has the right to vote and on and on it goes equal rights but here's where the the line gets crossed equal opportunities when a egalitarianism uh, advocate says something like this everybody ought to be forced to do everything or everybody ought to be uh, expected to do the same thing if you own your own business a catering business, and a gay couple comes in and says, I want you to cater the, uh, the wedding, you should have the right to say, yes, I will, or no, I won't, based upon your moral convictions. I was involved in a situation that was reverse discrimination. Now, I'm not bitter about it. They finally offered me the job, and I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm, God's called me to preach. But at that time, it was like we had an African-American man in this position, and if we don't hire that same race of a, a, back in that job, we're going to be accused, accused of being racist. We're going to get sued by people, and so, so we're kind of in a, in a corner we could talk a lot more about this. Let's move on. Complementarianism. That is the doctrine that men and women have different roles and responsibilities in marriage, in family, and in the church. In, in, in lay terms, it just says we have different roles. We have different responsibilities. It would be like on a, a ship. You have a captain. And you have a first mate, and I mean all the different offices and jobs on a ship. And it gives order, chain of command, organization, those kind of things. An egalitarianist would say something like this. Everybody should have the right to be the captain. Everybody should have the right to be the first mate. There's just If anybody wants it, whoever it is, qualified or unqualified, they should be able to hold that position. And most of us, uh, you know, we, we see the, uh, the flaw in that kind of logic. Now, we were rocking along pretty good. Everything, you know, was discussion here, discussion there. And then a couple things happened. First of all, the kind of flagship of the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest church in our convention, Saddleback Community Church, started in an apartment with Rick and Kay Warren, I think five other people. Now, I mean... Thousands, thousands, it's like, a, like an unbelievable movement. But they chose in May to ordain three women. And uh, I know for sure that two of them were already working in that position. One was a children's minister, one was a student minister. But they ordained these women to serve in that role. And that really rocked people. Three days later, Rick Warren has his wife Kay get up and preach the Mother's Day message. 
And all of a sudden, people were feeling this, this shaking. What's going on in our denomination? And asking denominational leaders, what, what are you going to do about this? And then the second thing really that happened was Beth Moore. The queen of Southern Baptist, the one that's put up in the spotlight, she leaves the Southern Baptist Convention. And later on, she tweets something about she was inadvertently active or passive in, in male sexism in the denomination. Well, you see, between, between these two things and other voices that are rising up and speaking, we're, we're, uh, we're saying, okay, what's going on here? What, what, you know, we, we just feel that. We feel some, some shifting sand. So I want to address that this morning. I'm going to ask you to be real honest. I'm going to ask you to be real transparent, at least with yourself today. Okay? Because I found out about myself. I was a closet sexist. Let me give you a couple of examples. If a man would tell me one thing and a woman would tell me the same thing, I would, I would listen a little more carefully to the man. I'd take a little more stock in what he had to say. And I know this sounds crazy, but when I'd see a man and a woman in a car and the woman was driving, I'd go, hmm, hmm, I'm not so sure about that. They better have a reason for that. And I'm just saying I found some areas of my life and pockets of my heart that I think were unhealthy. And so I want to give you just a little quiz, just a little look in the mirror and see where, where you think you are. Number one, men have greater leadership abilities than women. Now, these aren't right or wrong answers. These are opinions. This is just what, what you, you think. Number two, the idea that a man can be a stay-at-home dad while his wife works outside the home is anti-biblical. How do you feel about that? Number three, men and women should receive equal pay for the same job. Number four, allowing a woman to preach in church is a sin. Number five, this might be my favorite one. Promise keepers should allow and welcome women at their gatherings. I remember years ago going to a stadium and, and uh, outside there were women, you know, they were picketing. They were walking up and down with signs, you know, about, about PK being sexist, etc. Number six, women cannot be in leadership positions in a church because they, like Eve, are deceived, easily deceived. And we'll look at the 1 Timothy chapter 2 passage in just a few minutes. Number seven, can men preach to everyone, but women can only preach to children and other women? Number eight, only a man should be referred to as pastor. In other words, it's plenty fine to say Pastor Stephen, our student pastor, but it's not okay to say Pastor Dana. Because, not because she's the children's pastor or minister, but because she's a woman. So we need to be very clear to, you know, to differentiate between those. Number nine, I would rather have an average male boss than a great female boss. Think about that. Change, change the name. I'd rather have an average, average president than a female president. I'd rather have an average preacher than an outstanding female preacher. Boy, is it quiet in here this morning. Number 10. Women are called to leadership positions in the church because men have defaulted on their leadership responsibilities. I thought that for a long time. I took that as almost an axiom, almost a truism, almost, well, that's, yeah, that's the way it is. And so I want this morning, I want us to look at God's word carefully, but I want us to also be willing to push back against some of these things that we've accepted without thinking through. Now, the, go ahead and put up the next picture. Here's, here's a, a woman that led an army, at least part of an army, the French army in the Hundred Year War. Joan of Arc. And uh, 
a, a hero in France. And many, many, many Christian people think she's a, a great a heroine of the faith. But one, when the English captured her and tied her to a stake and set, set fire all around her and killed her, her last three words were, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But do you know one of the charges they had against her? She wore a, men, a man's uniform when she went to battle. That wasn't the only thing that the English were saying about her, but that was, that was one of their charges. Now, what I want to do, because most of us here, honestly, have not heard this side of the argument. We've, we've heard a lot about complementarianism and, and, and the kind of the party line, but we haven't heard much at all about this other side. And so I want to share the arguments that people who have the egalitarian uh, idea or, or theology, uh, this is what they say. Number one, both men and women reflect the image of God. Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Both male and female express the image of God. And it's not like men express 90% and women 10% of the image of God. We both do that. Number two, male dominance and, male dominance and prominence is a result of sin. Not an expression of grace. This is Genesis 3 after the fall. It says the woman said uh, to the woman he said. I will make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Is there an amen ladies? You deserve. Uh, your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. And what an egalitarian would say is this. Yes, this male dominance, this male prominence, this male rulership comes because of sin. It's a, just like the wages of sin is death. But along comes Jesus, along comes grace, and, and that's, that's changed. That's switched. Number three, there are multiple examples of women in leadership role in the Old and New Testament. I'm going to give you some of these because you say, I don't know, I'm, I may be a couple, but, but there's more than, than you think. So let's look in the Old Testament. First of all, uh, Moses' sister Miriam was a, was a prophet. Deborah was a prophet and a judge in Israel. Huldah, which I think is probably where we get the name Hilda, that's an interesting story found in 2 Chronicles 22. Uh, and uh, no, excuse me, 2 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 34, uh, Josiah, they, you know, they find the, the uh, scroll in the, as they're cleaning up the temple and they bring it to the high priest and the priest goes, we got, what, what's God going to do with this? And they take it to Hil Hulda, who is the wife of the king's tailor. And they ask her, what are we supposed to do with this? Uh, Zelophehad had five daughters. We're going to read that story in just a few minutes. But th these, again, are prominent examples, not the only in the Old Testament. You get to the New Testament, we see Anna, the prophet in the temple. She wasn't, she wasn't just called oh, the old lady that lives down at the temple. She was called a prophet. Phoebe, there's a very good case for uh, the fact that she might have been a deacon in Sincrea. Uh, Philip's four daughters, Philip the evangelist, the deacon who became an evangelist, had four unmarried daughters, and they are called uh, prophets. Priscilla, along with her husband Aquila, discipled Apollos, one of the great uh, apologetics uh, uh, experts of the New Testament. And then there's Euodia, who worked with Paul, and Paul refers to her uh, working in the church. And finally, there's uh, Junia, referred to in Romans chapter 16 as an apostle. So we need to, uh, again, not just think we know everything that we know about everything we need to know, but be willing to look at this. Argument number four, 
spiritual gifts are not gender specific. In Romans chapter 12, there are seven main spiritual gifts listed. And it doesn't say these are given to men and these are given to women. All seven of these spiritual gifts are for the body of Christ, including teaching and leading. And then argument number five, men and women are equal before God. In Galatians chapter 3, this, uh, this is probably the primary main argument of the egalitarians. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In other words, this is saying God doesn't lean toward the free. God doesn't lean toward the Jew. God doesn't lean toward men. We're all equal before him. Different roles, but equal before God. Number six, Bible passages must be seen in, a, in the cultural and contextual light. Now, here's a card we play ever so often. Here's something we say, yeah, we agree, but then, then a lot of times we say we don't agree with that. And so when Paul talks to the church at Corinth or Paul talks to Timothy, who is pastor at, at Ephesus, it's to, it's to discuss a certain issue. There's a problem going on, and Paul addresses this issue. It doesn't mean it's a timeless truth. What it means is this is the way you handle that particular problem. And you say, well, I don't believe in, in context, or I don't believe in culture. What do you do with the verse, greet one another with a holy kiss? You're going you're gonna to do that? I'll tell you what, they do it in Moldova. Moldova, and I was very uncomfortable. I walked around like this. <laughs> oh, boy, if you don't think I didn't. I mean, these big, burly, Eastern European men, I mean, you know, they're just, just tough and rough. The women, the babushkas are tougher than our men. And here are these big, tough men. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Number seven, a minority of men are leading a majority of women. The egalitarians would say, you know, almost two-thirds of the church is, is female. But about 10% of the leadership of church is female. And that seems very unequal. Now, we could sit here this morning and we could probably, until midnight and beyond, we could sit here and start, you know, back and forthing on this thing like a tennis match. But as we've done before and as we're going to do today, we're going to look at some scripture. We're going to, we can't, I mean, it's up to you to read the Bible in 90 days. I can't, you know, I can't do that for you. But what I can do this morning is look at, at passages of scripture that talk about these hot topics. And so the first one is Numbers chapter 27, verses 1 through 7. This is a, a hell of, excuse me, Zelephahad. I've pronounced it wrong my whole life, and now I'm trying to get it right. Okay, Zelephahed. It says, the daughters of Zelephahed, the son of Heper, the, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, belonged to the clan of Manasseh, son of Joseph. The names of the daughters were Mahiah, Noah, go figure, Hoglah, Milcah, and Terzah, they came forward and stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, and the leaders of the whole assembly at the entrance to the tent of meeting, and said, Our father died in the wilderness. He was not among Korah's followers who banded together against the Lord, but he died for his own sins and left no sons. Why should our father's name disappear from his clan? Because he has no son. Give us property rights among our father's relatives. So Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord said to him, What's the, here's what the Lord said about the issue. Zelophehad's daughters, what they're saying is right. You must certainly give them property as an inheritance among their father's relatives and give their father's inheritance to them. These five women were being overlooked. The, the law didn't address this. The assumption would have been no sons, no inheritance. And these five daughters stepped forward to Moses 
and, and Eliezer and said, hey, is that right? What, what about us? Should, should our, our family just be left out and wiped out? Uh, and, and they took it to the Lord and the Lord said, those ladies are right. They're right in what they're asking. They should be included in the inheritance in the property. Now, the second scripture found in Joshua 4, 4 and 5. Now Deborah, a prophet, of, uh, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. She led Israel. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes settled or decided. In a very, very uh, male-dominated, patriarchal culture, here's a woman named Deborah. Not only is she a leader, but she's a judge. They bring difficult cases to, uh, to uh, her to, to have her judge them. In fact, later on, when uh, Barak wants to, wants to go to war, he says, I'm not, if you don't go, I don't go. He said, I won't go if, if you don't go along with me. Scripture number three, Romans 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sincrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she is a benefactor of many people, including me. And then in Romans 16, greet Andronica and Junia, my fellow Jews, have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Now, that word dissertations and books have been made about that word uh, referring to Fabi. And some people say, well, it should be translated this way. And that. There are many, again, there, there are so many arguments about that, whether it should say deacon or servant or deacon's wife. It's the same word that's used in Acts when they pick the first seven deacons of the church. And the, word, the name Junia is a female name. It's getting quieter. I didn't think it could do that. No. Scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16. You maybe have heard a little of this or a lot of it, but, but here's what it says. Paul says to the church in Corinthians, uh, Corinth, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if... But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. If man did not come from woman, but woman from man, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought, it is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of angels. <laughs> yeah nevertheless in the Lord woman is not independent of man nor is man independent of woman for as woman came from man so man is born of woman but everything comes from God judge for yourself is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair it's disgraceful to him but if a woman has long hair, it's for her glory. For long hair is given for her covering. If anyone wants to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Honestly, what I found, uh, what I think, there's, there's just a lot of inconsistencies that we have. We say we believe this, but we don't really practice that, and we do this and the other. I'm just saying there's some things in here that need to be looked at. Scripture 5 1 Corinthians 14, three more chapters, uh, three chapters later, Paul says, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, 
must be, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. We've already had that this morning. Are we disgracing God? Are we in sin because of what we've done here this morning? Those, that's a question that, that, that we have to look at very carefully. Paul says women are not to speak in church, but he said earlier if they pray or if they prophesy. So what really is going on here? Now, 1 Timothy chapter 2, the one we talked about a little bit ago. Paul says, therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands. Are we, how many of us do that without anger or disputing? I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety. Not men, just women. Adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will, will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and propriety. Obviously, if we just take this at face value and just, oh, I read it and, and I know exactly what that means, then, then what we're saying is, okay, the woman was deceived. She disqualified herself. There's only one thing women really are good for, and that's having babies, but they better keep on the straight and narrow, and they'll be saved by that. Is that, is that what the Scripture is saying? Another commentary, interpretation, understanding of this, Paul was addressing specifically Timothy, who pastored the church in Ephesus. In Ephesus, there was a, the temple of Diana, the kind of the pagan of all pagan uh, temples, and the prophetesses or leaders in that temple were women and of course they were prostitutes and they were ungodly and sexual orgies and all these things were going on and so Paul is saying to them, don't there's no way that 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 Christian women should should look like that have that kind of authority have that kind of uh, uh, word in a church the word where it says a woman should remain silent, can be translated, settle down, or be receptive. And then finally, the last passage. These really aren't scriptures, these are, these are passages. 1 Timothy chapter 3 says, In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deeper truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then there's, if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but tempered and trustworthy in everything. And that word, the Greek word gune, can be translated woman or wife. Uh, both translations are, are acceptable. And then... Paul says, a deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his house, his children and household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. A couple questions that, that are brought up in here, and I think rightly so. If, if, this, is just, if this is saying deacons' wives then why is nothing said about the elders' wives? They're, they're omitted. If it's important for a deacon's wife to have these kind of, of, of character qualities and, and this, this, be this kind of person, uh, it doesn't need anything said about the elders' wives? That's for your consideration. Let me, think, let me throw you another one. If this is talking about the culture of polygamy, which they lived in, where it was legal for a man to have more than one wife, but it was illegal for a woman to have more than one husband. Maybe Paul is addressing it from that angle and saying, which I've resisted this, that I, that I think it's a, talking about the issue of polygamy, but it might be. 
I reserve the right to be wrong. It says literally, a one-woman man. Some scholars think the real issue is the, the polygamy issue that, that uh, Paul faced of that day. Here's what I'm going to tell you. In my research and study, and I, I researched this message more than anyone I, I think I've ever researched. I read and reread and read and Man, I was, I was back and forth, and I looked at this scripture, and I listened to commentaries. But here's what I found out, that a great number of evangelical scholars and a great number of our patriarchs in the faith, our patriarchal fathers, believe that from this, that, it's, that women deacons are as biblical as men deacons. I want to give you one more thing, okay? Before the, before the uh, execution. Here is, an, here is a very, uh, this article helped me. I have a lot of respect for, for Jim Dennison. I've watched him for years. He was pastor of First Baptist Midland. He was pastor of Second uh, uh, Ponce de Leon Church in Atlanta. He was pastor of Park Cities in Dallas. Has a rock solid ministry. He left that to become an apologist to speak about the issues of the day. And his, the Denison Forum is one I very much appreciate. He's made me think. He's, made, he's, you know, he's, he's he, in my mind, he's very solid and he's very biblical. He wrote an article on this. You can read it. It takes about an hour. He had 67 references in his article. Things that he had researched and he wrote as references in, uh, in the blog. I would encourage you to go to that. Go to, you know, just Google in something like women in leadership in the church, uh, denisonforum.org. As I said from the very first message, I believe that you have the right to know where your pastor stands on these issues. I think you have the right to, to, to know and see my heart and my my thoughts, it doesn't mean you have to agree with them 100%. I doubt if there's any two people in this church that see everything eye to eye. And yet we are the body of Christ. So, so let me, I'm just going to share these with you. And the first, the first belief, the first perspective that I hold is the complementarian viewpoint is, bibl is bibl biblically correct but can result in theological overreach. And here's what I've seen in many situations. We take a truth and we just extrapolate it. We take it and we push it and push it and push it to a limit that's, that's not biblical or healthy. Healthy. I don't like labels. I, if somebody wants to call me something, I hope it's not an egalitarian or a, a complementarian, but a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. But I, and, and I agree so much with this complementarian that there is order and there is structure and there's a chain of command in the church, in, uh, in your home, in, in many areas of life. But again, we can take a Bible truth and we can twist it or we can overextend it. We can take it too far. What Mark Driscoll did up in Seattle was he took a biblical truth and he took it way, way, way too far. And if you know me, you know I don't name names. But I want you to, I want you to check this one out. The second thing that I would say is the church should have the humility to learn, grow, and change as led by the Holy Spirit. And I know the C word is very disconcerting to all of us. That word change, all of a sudden we start, you know, we start getting kind of nervous and, and upset about that. But it's very arrogant to sit here, any of us, and say, I've got the final truth about anything. There's no more room for me to grow. No more room for me to learn. No more uh, room for us to, to uh, understand anything more than what we do right now. 
Let me give you what I think is a, a very good example of that. Years ago, we were in this building program. And if any pastor is, is taught one thing in seminary, it's don't raise any controversial issues during a building program. You won't make it. You won't survive. And so just try to keep the peace through the building program, and then you, know, you can move on. Well, we had a, a committee. The, the, uh, I asked a, a committee of our church people uh, to look at our Constitution and bylaws and just see what we need to do. Becky, you were on that. Orville, you were on it. I can't remember the five-member committee, I think, five or seven. But anyway, in the middle of our building program, they came back and they said, hey, the Bible talks about elders and deacons. Why don't we have elders and deacons in our church? And my answer was, well, uh, you know, Baptist, uh, well, you know. And they said, Pastor, we want to be biblical. And I look back on some of the, the best decisions that this church has ever made. We brought it to the church in the middle of the building program. We explained it the best we could. The church voted, and it was unanimous that we go to the elder deacon uh, uh, paradigm of the church. What if we just said, no, we don't change, we don't do anything different. We know the way to do it, and our way is the only way. Number three, the doctrine of headship is no more important than the doctrine of partnership. If I had one point to make this this would be my point I think many of us myself have this idea you know here's the pioneer family and the headship the man leads the way and the women's a few steps behind and the kids trail along behind and and that's and there is the doctrine of headship absolutely but is it any more important than the doctrine of partnership when I see that pioneer family, I see a covered wagon, and I see a wife sitting right beside her man. I see her not, not so much as a tag along behind, but as a partner. And I think we've, we've, we've so uh, hammered the doctrine of headship that we've neglected the doctrine of partnership. I'm three minutes over. Here you go. Let me finish up. Number four, God has a, both a masculine and feminine voice. The image of God is represented in male and female. I believe the voice is also represented that way. The prophetesses of the Old Testament, the New Testament were voices for God. They spoke for God. Somebody was, was, you know, kind of getting on me for, for listening to a woman preacher uh, that Patty and I like to listen to. And, and I thought, okay, God, am I, you know, am I stepping out of the bounds? Am I missing it? And I believe God spoke to me. And he said, the voice of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 9 is the voice of a woman. Listen to her. Proverbs 31, a woman, her, her conduct and her life speaks to us. Patty and I have said, listen, Joyce Myers helped our marriage more than, than uh, Jimmy Evans or Emerson Egerich or James Dobson. She's been a, a, a wonderful voice of God speaking to us in our marriage. Number five, legalism is just as deadly as liberalism. And I... If I'm right about, I, I just sense, you know, oh, there he goes. There goes pastor. He's going to the dark side. He's going to be a flaming liberal. He's going to be all crazy and stuff like that. Jesus had, had, it looks to me, more trouble with the legalists than he did the liberals. I mean, they, he was always constantly butting heads. Here's my tendency. Legalism. I promise you, I could, be the, the, I could be the president of the legalist society. I've been, I've been that way. I've been that way. I'm, I'm like that. And I find every time I get like that, you know what I get? I get self-righteous. I get critical and judgmental of other people. Number six, in these critical times, we need to utilize every person and their giftings. 
One of the great moments in, for our family uh, was the junior year. Of, uh, my boys played basketball throughout school, but in the junior year, uh, my son Abe came off the bench in a playoff game and, and made a couple shots, and we beat the number one team in the state. We don't abuse women at Oak Street. I know that. My question is, are we using women as God intended? Are they having the complete role that God gave them in our church? How many people have been blessed by Judy leading the Bible in 90 days? Ashley Hodges came to, to me and Lowell the other day and explained that. I mean, they, she's spearheading a, a, a movement to revive the rock for teenagers, reaching students in, in Graham, Texas, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to squelch that. We'll say, Get back in the kitchen. Hey, we don't want to hear that. If it's not an idea from a man, then it's really not a good idea. Very quickly, number seven, we must not be afraid to re-examine our purpose, our priorities, or our perspectives on controversial issues. Only the insecure, the narcissistic, say it is my way and my way is 100% right. It takes humility, it takes tremendous courage to look at these hot topics, these controversial issues. I'm, afraid, I'm really afraid one of, the, one of the greatest hindrances to the church is we go, well, well if, we, if we're not perfect, if, uh, we know we're sinners, but we've got to be perfect. And, and if we change, that means we weren't perfect. And I disagree with that. Number eight, godly men and women make a powerful impact on the world. I think there's a big difference between a woman having her role, and a woman being put in her place. It was a bombshell when my dad told me, hey, it's the, the greatest uh, chefs in the world are men. Oh, my gosh, I, I, I know, I can't, I don't, I don't see how that works. That's kind of weird. We're not in competition the if gathering against the promise keepers. It's to be complementary. We're to work together and partner together. Hebrews 11.35, besides talking about Rahab the harlot, it also talks about women who received back their dead. Number nine, the church should appreciate the value of women. The old saying, behind every great man is a great woman, telling him to take out the trash. But you see, even in that, behind, behind, behind. We need to, to appreciate the role that women play in our church. And number 10, if you're still listening, number 10. <laughs> each autonomous church should decide the look and function of their leadership under the lordship of Christ. We're not God. We are those who listen to God and follow his leadership. In, uh, I just lost my, my place. In, uh, in Romans chapter 14, that's where it is. Paul says, who are you to judge someone else's servant? And then he, and then he says this. He said, one person calls one day sacred, another says they're all the same. It's okay. And one of the beauty, uh, beautiful things and the strengths of Southern Baptist life and Baptist in general is the autonomy of the local church. What does that mean? To me, it means if Saddleback wants to ordain women who are in ministry, they can do that. If Joyce Myers preaches to 15,000 men and women, that's okay. If Robert Jeffers at First Baptist Church Dallas 
says he is not against women being ordained as deacons. Who am I to throw rocks at them or judge them or criticize them for what they believe is God's will? And so I want to close with just a few questions. Number one, am I in favor of ordaining women uh, deacons and elders? No. Question two, am I... uh, Am I certain that women are excluded from the deaconship? No, I'm not. I'm not as certain as I used to be. Number three, am I becoming a progressive liberal? (laughs) I pray to God that I am becoming a stronger follower of Jesus Christ. That's what I pray for myself and for us. And I'll, I pray that I have enough courage and faith to look at controversial issues. And here's the final hot topic question. What am I asking this church to do? And here's my answer. Go to Acts 17:11. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica. For when they heard the preaching of Paul, they searched the, they searched the Scripture daily to see if what he was saying was true. Dig into the Word of God. Study, pray like you've never done before. Ask God to reveal truth to us, to show us what His perfect will is for our church. I don't want us to be egalitarian. I barely knew the word complimentary until it started being thrown around. What I'm asking you to do is be biblical and be godly. Let's pray. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I want to tell you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the highlight of camp change for me was when a grandfather and grandmother came and said, our grandchildren have accepted Christ in our family devotion today. We want people to come to know Christ. We want people to to embrace the faith in Jesus Christ that will take them to heaven when they die, but that they will experience God in this life. And we're really just talking about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Are you committed to follow Him? If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, I would encourage you right now, just say, Lord Jesus, if this is your heart, say, Lord Jesus, save me, change me, make me yours forever. Maybe there's somebody that, you, you, I mean, is so on your heart. We have so many people in our church right now that are wrestling with issues, dealing with, with hard things in their life. And this altar is open to pray for them. I had a family camp come up to me the very last thing before we left last night and say, we, we know now God wants us to be a part of Oak Street. Maybe that's your maybe that's your heart. Maybe you know that. I'm going to pray, and then I'll ask us to stand, and uh, the altar's open. Father, I just come to you. Lord, you know my prayer. That anything I've said that's not from you, let it just fall to the ground and just die a speedy and complete death. Lord, if there's anything this morning that your spirit has spoken to the heart of any person, may they they follow you, Lord, fully and faithfully. I pray, Lord, that that we would say as a church, we, we don't agree about every detail of everything. 
But Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of this church. Lord, your kingdom come. Lord, your will be done. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and uh, our worship band, Stephen, I've got to be dragging, but he's, uh, he's up here this morning just leading the worship. If you need to come, the altar's open. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Your justice flows. Like the ocean's tide And I will lift my high voice To worship you, my King And I will find my high strength In the shadow Reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness stretches to the skies. 